an issue. All right, so we're gonna talk about correlation and regression. Again, this is the last topic that we're actually gonna talk about this semester. Um, and I created these fill in the blank notes because it's kind of a, it's not a difficult process, but it's a lengthy process. And within correlation and regression, we have a modified hypothesis test. So we're not totally going to get away from um, hypothesis testing. One of the big primary differences, one of the reasons we choose to talk about um, correlation and regression is because it is the first scenario, quite honestly, where we're going to deal with bivariate data. Um, you probably know, I, I would anticipate that you do, um, that bi means two. Variate is the adjective form of variable. So bivariate data means we're gonna be dealing with two variables simultaneously at the same time. And up to date, up to this point in the course, we've really only dealt with one. Whether that one was sorted into categories like it was for the analysis of variance or whether it was qualitative like it was for chi-square goodness of fit. So that's one of the reasons why we introduce um, correlation or regression to you. It's also possible we're focusing on bivariate where you have two, but you can also perform correlation and regression with three or four or five variables. We're doing only two, again, because of the limitations of the time frame within the course itself. So correlation and regression is used to determine if a relationship exists between two quantitative variables. Okay, between two quantitative variables. So the question that you usually see um, in relationship to correlation and regression is gonna be, is there a relationship between say height and weight? Is there a connection between your age and your blood pressure? Um, you're gonna see words like relationship, connection, um, that sort of thing. And the other key thing that I just pointed out is you're going to have two variables and they're both quantitative, which means you're going to be dealing with numbers. Some examples that I have here on um, the fill in the blank notes are things like, is the volume of sales for a given month related to the amount of advertising for the month? Um, that might be something you would look at within the business world. Is a student's score on the first exam related to the number of hours that the student studies? Is the lifespan of an elephant related to its birth weight? Is a person's age related to his or her blood pressure? Okay, so I mean, we can look at any kind of relationship. Sometimes it's crazy. There was one several years ago in, an, um, in a textbook that was an example um, was ice cream consumption um, related to um, the, the number of crimes that occur, which seems like an odd relationship. And sometimes, some even on news reports and things, you'll hear crazy things and you're going, who cares? I mean, what does that have to do with anything? Um, you know, so sometimes it's crazy relationships. Sometimes it's very relevant um, depending upon what scenario you have. So, and we call it correlation and regression. It's really two procedures or two processes that are connected to one another. The first one, which is the correlation, the correlation procedure determines if a relationship exists between the two variables. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is, is there a relationship? And the process or the procedure that we go through for correlation is going to help us to say, yes, there is a relationship or no, there's not a relationship. If you think about the word correlation, 
Um, again, from an English perspective, you may know that the prefix co typically means with, and then you have the word relation. So the idea of correlation is that idea of, is there a relationship? Because correlation literally means with relation. The regression procedure creates a model of the relationship that can then be used to help you make predictions. So for example, if you were looking at the um, scenario of the volume of sales related to the volume of advertising, and you conclude that there is a relationship, you can then create a model of that relationship. Fancy way to say we're gonna make an equation. And then we can use that model to predict. If I spend you know, X amount on advertising, this is the volume of sales that I can expect. It gives you um, that, ability to kind of make predictions and, and know what your expectations will be. Again, there are multiple relationships that we can look at. We can look to see, is the relationship linear? Is it what we call quadratic? Is it exponential? Is it logistical, which is a logarithmic? And you hear that a lot, especially um, if you're interested in going into the field that we have of supply logistics and supply chain management. We talk a lot about logistical models. Okay, so our focus in this particular course, though, is going to be on linear regression. And again, we limit our discussion to linear regression because of the time frame. Now, again, in the next course, which is Math 2401, we spend some time looking at the other relationships, especially exponential and logistical, um, because that typically will lead into the BBA program. Okay, so I want to focus, first of all, on the correlation procedure. And again, in the correlation procedure, what we're really asking ourselves is we're, we're asking ourselves, is there a relationship between variable number one and variable number two. So that's kind of the question. And so when you see that question, the first thing you're gonna do is go through this correlation procedure. And guys, I have the procedure outlined in the way that it'll be presented in D2L on your homework problems, on your practice problems, and, excuse me, on your module four exam and on the final exam. So the first step in the process is to identify what we call the independent variable, which is typically represented by the letter X. If you go back to your algebra days, okay, in algebra, typically when we have bivariate data or two variables, we usually represent them as a set of ordered pairs. You would have done this in college algebra in quantitative reasoning most likely, and you might be asked to find, say, um, the equation of the line between two points. Well, the idea behind correlation and regression is the same, but instead of looking at only two points, we're gonna look at lots of points, maybe 10 points, 20 points, 30 points. Okay, so this idea of the independent variable is the same idea that you had of independent variable in college algebra or quantitative reasoning. And again, we usually represent it by the letter X, okay? Most times, because we're dealing with bivariate data and it's paired with one another, okay? It's presented in a table form or possibly as ordered pairs, okay? So in a table, 
typically your independent variable is going to be in the left column, left column or top row. Okay, so that's one way to tell if the data is presented in a table form. If it's presented in ordered pair, the independent would be the X. After you've identified the independent, you have to identify the dependent. It's kind of like you've only got two variables. So once you identify one, by default, the other one has to be the dependent. We represent the dependent with the letter Y. Again, that's a carryover from our algebra days. And again, in order pair form, the second number in the ordered pair would be your Y, which would be your dependent. If you're thinking about it in terms of a table, again, usually it's presented in table form for the dependent, the usually the right column or the bottom row is gonna be your dependent variable. So there's a little saying that you can use to help you remember, you may have even learned this in your college algebra or quantitative reasoning, but if we, if we say blank depends on blank, so typically whatever you say first is going to be your Y variable or the dependent depends on the X variable or the independent. So again, just for example sake, if we go back to our examples here um, that I had at the beginning and we think about it, we have the volume of sales compared to the amount of advertising. So those are the two things that we're looking at. We're looking at the volume of sales and the amount of advertising. Now, I don't have any data here to, to look at so I may have to kind of think for a minute. Okay, so if I think about it, the amount of advertising I would anticipate is going to affect the volume of sales. Okay, so the volume of sales depends on the amount of advertising. So in this case, my Y variable or the dependent is the volume of sales and the amount of advertising would be my X. The other thing you wanna think about, those phrases, independent, dependent, hopefully that'll focus itself in a minute. Independent and dependent. Independent has that sense of you can manipulate it. So the one thing that I can affect or I can change in thinking about volume of sales or if I can get this to focus. Volume of sales or amount of advertising is I can, as the company, I can change how much I spend on advertising. I can't really directly affect the amount of sales. Similarly, if we think about, say, the lifespan of an elephant compared to its birth weight. And in a sense, I can't really control either one of those. I suppose more so I could control the birth weight because I can make sure that the mama elephant, you know, has their proper nutrition, the, you know, and that kind of stuff. So if we think about it, the birth weight or the lifespan depends on the birth weight. So the lifespan would be Y, the birth weight would be X. Okay, so it's gonna be important that you identify them properly from the beginning, because if you don't, that can affect what you do later. Okay, so it's important to identify X and Y properly first. There are really two ways that we think about, remember we're trying to answer the question, is there a relationship between variable one and variable two? And there's two perspectives that we're gonna look at. One is we're gonna take a look at it from a visual perspective. 
using our eyeballs. And the second way is we're gonna take a look at it um, algebraically, okay? So step three is our visual perspective. Where we're gonna use our eyeballs and our gut to make a decision. What we do in step three is you review the given scatter plot. A scatter plot, and I'll explain what that is in just a minute, okay, will either be given to you or you can create one in Minitab, and we'll talk about how to create one. But a scatter plot is, is a graph, okay? Um, because we have two variables, we would use our standard kind of coordinate plane. Your horizontal axis usually represents the X. The vertical axis represents the Y. And then we have each of the ordered pairs just plotted on the, on the graph. And it's called a scatter plot. We've plotted the ordered pairs or we've plotted the bivariate data, but they're just scattered. And so we have to look at that scatter plot, whether we have it already given to us or whether we create it. You wanna take a step back and make sure you look at the big picture. Don't get so tunnel visioned that you can't see the big picture. And as you're looking at that scatter plot, you're gonna ask yourself three questions. You're gonna ask yourself, does there appear to be an overall pattern within the data points? Does there appear to be some sort of pattern there? Now, you're either going to say, yes, there is a pattern or no, there's not a pattern. And again, you're basing that solely on your eyeballs. So Katie may say, yeah, I think there's a pattern. But Isabella may say, Miss Ralston, there ain't no pattern there. Okay, so different folks could have different, different researchers could interpret it differently. Okay, so oftentimes we don't totally rely on our gut, but this just gives us a jumping off point. So does there appear to be an overall pattern? In our case, we're gonna ask, does the overall pattern appear to be linear? And we're asking, is it linear? Because that's the only kind we're gonna deal with. So if I've got some other pattern, I'm probably gonna just stop there. Now, again, in the next course, you get to explore a little bit more. Again, you're gonna say yes or no. And again, there can be disagreement. This time Isabella may say, well, yeah, I think there's, it looks like I can make a line out of some of that. But then Katie may say, mm -mm, you can't make a line out of that. So again, there's disagreement, okay? Depending on who whose eyes are looking, you know, and I might have a different opinion too it, it, when I'm looking at it. Okay, so the third thing said, the third question you ask is, does the overall pattern appear to be positive, negative, or zero? This relates back to the idea of slope. If you think back to your algebra days, this relates back to your idea of slope. Hopefully you learned in algebra that whenever a line, and I'm gonna draw a line here, line appears to go up as you move left to right, that that slope is greater than zero or it's what we call positive. If the line appears to go down as you move left to right, like a slide, then the slope is negative 
or less than zero. And if the slope is exactly zero or you have a flat line, a horizontal line, that means your slope is zero and basically that there's no change going on. So that again, that question is kind of think in your mind, think about slope. So you wanna look at it, do the, do, the, do the values appear to go up? Do they appear to go down? Or do they kind of just stay the same? Now, we're gonna use mini tab instead of the free website. So in step three, we've looked at a picture and we've decided, yes, there appears to be a pattern. Yes, it appears linear. And then it's either positive, negative or zero, okay? So you really have to say yes and yes in order to proceed. And really, even if you say no and no, you're going to go on to step four. Because remember, this is with our eyes and we don't rely solely on our eyes. So when we get to step four, step four, and I'm gonna write it here on the side, is our algebra, whoops, left out letter, sorry. Algebraic perspective. And this gets us a number rather than relying just on our eyeballs, okay? the step four is going to help us get an actual numeric value about that relationship. It's called the sample linear correlation coefficient. And it's represented by the lowercase letter R. It's called the sample linear correlation coefficient. A population linear correlation coefficient also exists. Remember, um, the population is represented by Greek letters the sample by English letters. So for again, for English letters, the sample linear correlation is the letter R. For the population, it's a Greek letter and it's the Greek letter rho. It looks like a little P, kind of just a little fancy P. Now, if you wanna get really fancy dancy dancy, it's called Pearson's Product Moment Linear Correlation Coefficient. I mean, that's the kind of the, the grand title of what we're gonna calculate. Pearson's Product Moment Linear Correlation Coefficient. It's named after a statistician, I believe he was English as well, like um, Sir Ronald Fisher. Um, his name was Carl Pearson. And the Pearson's product moment linear correlation coefficient is a numerical measurement of the strength of the linear relationship. Now, this measurement or this statistic, if you will, that we're about to learn to talk about how to calculate, which Minitab is going to calculate it for us. Okay, but that measurement only measures the strength of a linear relationship. So if you don't have um, a linear relationship, then you really don't want to calculate this value because this value only measures linear. Its value, whether you're talking about for the population row or for the sample, its value is always between negative one and positive one. 
the value of the linear correlation coefficient for either the sample or the population is always between negative one and positive one. Now, what does that mean? Let's think about what that means in kind of in this overall context. Again, if you think about this kind of like a thermometer, okay, and on one extreme you have negative one and on the other extreme you have positive one and in the middle, of course, you're gonna have zero. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you have a linear correlation coefficient of negative one, that means you have a perfect negative linear relationship. And visually, what you would have, I'm going to draw some pictures here on the top of this next page. Okay, a perfect linear, negative linear relationship, if you looked at the scatter plot, you would have the ordered pairs or your data points lined up in a perfectly straight line that has a negative slope. So this would be an R value of negative one. Now think about it. Think about how often that's going to occur. Probably never. On the other extreme, you would have a perfect positive linear relationship. And so visually you would have your scatter plot and again your points would be lined up one behind the other like you're trying to line up kids to go to lunch one behind the other six feet apart these days. Okay, in a perfect straight line with a positive slope. And again, that's going to be very rare to occur. If the value is zero, zero means there's no linear correlation. Okay, if the R value is near zero, that means it's not a line. And there's several different graphs you could have there. One option might be that you have a pattern that in the dots that is not linear. So maybe you have one of those patterns that is um, like a quadratic where you have kind of that U-shaped curve. Or it could be that you have what I like to call paint splatter where you just have a bunch of random dots on the graph and there really is no rhyme or reason to those dots. Okay, and in either case, your R value is going to be close to zero or zero because there's no linear pattern. So again, you got to think about this as a thermometer. Okay, if you, if you start out at zero thinking, okay, there's no relationship. As you move closer to positive one, the stronger positive relationship you're going to have. Or if you start at zero and you move towards negative one, the stronger negative linear relationship you're gonna have. The closer you get to one or to negative one, the stronger the relationship, okay? So this number that we calculate from the data, and we're gonna let Minitab calculate it cause it's got, it's got three square roots, it's a fraction, you got a square root in the top and two square roots in the bottom. Y'all would kill me if I had you figure it by hand. It's, a, it's awful. So we're gonna let Minitab calculate it for us. Okay. Um, but then you have to be able to interpret it. Now, again, we get the number. Okay. We've looked at it from a visual perspective and our gut tells us yeah, I think there's a pattern and I think it's linear. We calculate the linear correlation coefficient. We get that number 
And again, the number maybe supports what we think because it's got, a, you know, I've got a value maybe that's close to one or close to negative one. If it's close to zero, remember, that's going to tell me I don't have a linear relationship at all. But again, I, it, from a statistical perspective, we don't get to just say, well, okay, there we go. We have to determine, is it statistically significant? Is that number close enough to negative one or close enough to positive one or far enough from zero for us to say beyond a shadow of a doubt, oh, yay, we've got a um, linear correlation. Okay, so you have to keep going for the next two steps before you can actually say yay or nay. So I still haven't answered the question yet. Okay, so step five, after I've looked at the graph, I've calculated my correlation coefficient, then I've got to determine if R is statistically significant using a modified hypothesis test. This is where the hypothesis test comes into play. It's going to help me to decide is R statistically significant to the point that I can say, yes, there is a relationship. And it's modified in the sense that we don't do all of the six steps. Okay, so we still, step one, we still have to state our hypotheses. You still have the null hypothesis. And remember, the null hypothesis must always contain equal in some form. So for our purposes, it will always contain equal. The null hypothesis, when you're talking about correlation, will always be that rho, which is the population linear correlation coefficient, is equal to zero, which means there is not a linear relationship and R is not statistically significant. Okay, so the statement is just going to be rho equals zero, but you got to know what that means so that you can interpret it in a few minutes. The alternative hypothesis will be that rho does not equal zero, which means there is a linear relationship and R is statistically significant. Now, here again, we're not using the free website. I forgot to change that because we just have started using Minitab. We're going to use Minitab. We will determine only, only, the only thing I care about is the p-value of the test statistic. Okay, that's the modification. I don't really care what the test statistic is and all that kind of stuff. All I care about is the p-value because the p-value is what allows me to determine whether to reject the null or fail to reject the null by comparing that p-value to the level of significance. And we generally use alpha equals 0.05. It's usually not stated in the problem, but that's the general rule of thumb. Using, guys, the rules haven't changed, okay? And just in case you have forgotten them, okay? The rule has not changed. If P is less than or equal to alpha, we reject. And if P is greater than alpha, we fail to reject. Those guidelines, which we've had since we started talking about hypothesis testing, have not changed. 
They're not gonna. So after we've looked at the p-value, then we make our conclusion. Is R statistically significant? That's gonna be one of the questions that you're asked. Is R statistically significant? And you will say yes or no. Now, you may say, well, when do you say yes and when do you say no? Okay, so if you reject the null, which says rho is equal to zero, then that means the alternative is true. So if you reject the null, you're gonna say yes, R is statistically significant. If you fail to reject, you're gonna say no, R is not statistically significant. And then the last step, in before you can say without a doubt yes there is a linear relationship or no there's not is to conclude if there is a correlation between the two variables and again you're going to answer yes or no and guys it's a it's kind of a process Okay, and if you if you think about it, it'll it'll uh, hopefully it'll make sense to you. Okay, so here's the deal: if we reject the null when p is less than or equal to alpha, that means that r is statistically significant and a correlation exists. So that would be like saying yes. So you reject the null, you're gonna say yes, R is statistically significant. Yes, there is a relationship. But if you fail to reject, the null, when P is greater than alpha, then that means R is not statistically significant and a correlation does not exist. So this would like be saying no. So if you say, if you fail to reject the null, you're going to say no, R is not statistically significant, and no, there is not a correlation. If you say to me, no, there is not a correlation, if at this point you say no, you stop. Because basically what you've determined is there's not a relationship. And if there's not a relationship, how can I find a model for it? I can't find a model for a relationship that doesn't exist. But if you say yes, then you gotta keep going to the second process. And I had that written here at the top of the next page that I wrote down there at the bottom. Okay. So let me fill in those blanks for you. Okay. If you answer yes, okay, I got to make sure I say it right. If you answer yes, then continue to the regression procedure below. But if you say no, then stop. But you can use the average or the mean of the Y values for prediction purposes. You can still make predictions even if there's not a relationship. We just use the average or the mean. 
And you already know how to calculate that because that's where you add them all up, divide by how many you have. I mean, you it for you. So we've decided, yes, there is a relationship. So then we're gonna move on to the next step where we actually are going to create a model of that relationship. Okay, so we're gonna determine the, in for details, the linear regression model in the form. And here's the form and I'll make some connections for you in just a minute. Usually we write it y, hat, y prime, Y with a little tick mark to indicate that it was created through regression equals, and different texts do it differently. Some will do um, B plus AX. Um, you can also see it as um, AX plus B. It, it kind of depends on which textbook, which author you pick up. But I hope that that looks familiar to you. Okay, different letters of a little bit of a different symbol. But again, if you go back and think about your algebra. And I could almost be willing to bet if I ask you what's the equation of a line. That you guys would tell me y equals mx plus b. Y'all remember that from algebra days? Where m represented the slope and B was your y-intercept. And in algebra, usually we were creating this model using only two ordered pairs in most cases in algebra. Well, we're doing the same thing in statistics with the linear regression model, but we're using maybe five ordered pairs or 10 ordered pairs or 20 ordered pairs. They often say the more data you have, the better the model, okay? And so it's that same idea, we're trying to create the slope. They don't really call it slope in the linear regression model, it's called the average rate of change. That's why they use the letter A. But in this model, the A represents the slope and the B would be your y-intercept. Now, whether that comes first in it or second in it, the letter or the value in front of the X is your slope and the constant is your y-intercept. Okay, mini tab will do this for you. Again, the calculations, if we're trying to do that by hand, are just crazy. Okay, just crazy. So we use the model to make a prediction. for a given a value for the independent variable, which is X, okay? Once you have the model, you can use the model to make a prediction for a given value of the independent variable. And I'm not sure what I have here, I probably got a typo. Then the last thing is in all of these calculations and all of the results, we get a value called R squared. It's called the coefficient of determination. It's called the coefficient of determination. 
And what the coefficient of determination tells us is whether or not it's appropriate. Is it appropriate to use the amount of advertising to predict the volume of sales? Is it appropriate to use the birth weight to determine the lifespan of an elephant? The question will usually say, is um, amount of sales a good predictor? Or excuse me, amount of advertising a good predictor for the dependent variable? Is the birth weight a good predictor? And ultimately, you're gonna say yes or no. Now, there's really some other statistical analyses that comes into play here. But again, because of our limitations of time, we're gonna limit what we do. And so we're gonna kind of use this rule of thumb. The rule of thumb says, if your coefficient of determination is greater than 50%, then we're gonna say, yes, it's a good predictor, okay? So we're gonna say yes, when R squared is greater than 50%, and R squared is usually stated as a percentage. And then the last thing is you want to offer up an explanation or an interpretation of what that coefficient of determination tells you. And this is the sentence that you would write. Now you have to fill in the blanks, okay? So we would say approximately, whatever the R, R squared value is, approximately R squared percent of the variation, gotta have the word variation in there, in the Y variable, is determined by the variation in the X variable. Okay, word for word, approximately R squared percent of the variation in the Y variable is determined by the variation in the X variable. That's the interpretation of R squared. And I believe at that point, we're done, okay? So again, you can see, of course I left some space and things like that, but it is a relatively lengthy process. Let me kind of walk us back through the, the process real quick. We start out asking ourselves, is there a relationship? We identify the roles of each variable, which one is the independent, which one is the dependent. Then we look at the graph using our eyeballs and our gut to think about, is there a pattern? Is the pattern linear? And then would the pattern be positive, negative, or zero? We use mini tab to calculate the linear correlation coefficient which should always have a value between negative one and positive one. We then have to ask ourselves, is the R statistically significant? And we perform our modified hypothesis test. And it, it all comes down to whether we reject the null or fail to reject the null. If we reject the null, then R is statistically significant and there is a correlation coefficient uh, excuse me, there is a correlation or a linear relationship exists. If we fail to reject, R is not significant and there is not a correlation. Then if there is a correlation, we move on to determine the model. Again, all of that's gonna be done within Minitab. We can then use the model to make a prediction we also are given the core coefficient of determination so we can think about is it appropriate or is the y var or the x variable a good predictor of the y? Does it make sense to use it? We can also then think about, um, depending on the value of that coefficient of determination, we can also think about what other things may be affecting those numbers. Okay, again, it's a lengthy process. One other thing that I wanna to mention to you, 
that will come into play when we start looking at these problems. And I'm trying to find a space where I can write it um, on one of these pieces of paper. So I'm gonna write it at the top, I think of this third page here, okay? Remember, visually, you're going to say, I, it looks like we have a positive pattern or a negative pattern or a zero pattern, okay? The value of your R, your linear correlation coefficient, should be not value. Let me say, let me change it to sign the sign, S-I-G-N, of the R should be the same as the sign of the slope. So if you have said from the graph, I think that there, that it appears to be negative, that it appears to go downhill, then your R, your linear correlation coefficient, should be negative because you've said visually there look there appears to be a negative relationship because it's going down. If you say it's positive, then the sign of your linear correlation coefficient should be positive. The sign, the S-I-G-N, whether it's positive or negative, should be the same as the slope. If the slope is positive, R is positive. If the slope is negative, then, then R is negative. And guys, that's gonna be important. That's gonna come into play when we start looking at these examples. Now, quite honestly, with the lengthy process that it is, we don't have time to go through a full example today. So I wanna stop at this point. Maybe you can kind of soak all these steps in um, have some time to work on your um, homeworks from Chi-Square Goodness of Fit and from ANOVA over the weekend. And then next Wednesday, we will come back and actually do examples, begin with examples of correlation and regression. Questions? All right, if there are none, then we are um, 